Aloha. Good morning, those in Hawaii, afternoon or evening, those elsewhere. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii for another difficult conversation to make good trouble with. David Larson, chair of the ABA section of dispute resolution and professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, and Jeff Portnoy, leading constitutional and First Amendment lawyer, adjunct professor at the University of Hawaii Law School, and one of our leading legal rights and public commentators, especially on First Amendment rights and other pressing legal issues. Well, folks, I think what's on everybody's minds today is we have another tragedy in Uvalde, Texas. 19 children, two adults have died. <clears throat> Jeff, your thoughts? What concerns you about this? Wow. I mean, uh, obviously, the fact that within 10 days, we've had another mass shooting. This time, another school. Little kids' lives snuffed out. Some 18-year-old kid able to get a rifle and ammunition, a vest somehow make his way into the school. I mean, we've just, as Yogi Berra said, in a much more friendly environment, it's deja vu all over again. There's just something wrong with this country. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this doesn't happen anywhere else, certainly not as frequent. I mean, it happened once in Norway, it happened once in, you know, country X and Y. It happens here almost on a weekly basis that there's gun violence and mass killings. And yet this country, the elected officials in this country, refuse to try to address the problem, blaming it on mental health, other than the fact that anybody can get a gun, almost anybody in this country, depending upon what state you're in, you can carry a gun. I was telling you folks before we got on the air that I saw this morning, whether it was a tweet or an Instagram from Governor Abbott a few weeks ago, uh, bemoaning the fact that Texas had fallen behind California in gun permits and people carrying guns and urging the residents of Texas to take back first place. You hear Ted Cruz this morning blaming the Democrats and the media for politicizing this. Uh, you see 50 Republican senators refusing to address the issue. And look, I understand the Second Amendment, although it's been perverted. And by the way, wait for the Supreme Court in the next three weeks to make it easier to carry a gun. That's a given. So, you know, you have to work within those confines, but the inability to make it more difficult for people like this killer to, to get a gun without interfering with the rights of people, uh, you know, to, to have a gun if they think it's necessary. So it's a long answer, Chuck. And um, it's just another sad morning in America. No, I appreciate it. You've covered a lot of aspects and a very thoughtful one. David, your thoughts? Oh, yeah, I you know, I guess as a starter, I'm just continue to be so discouraged and disappointed by the dishonesty of it all. Um, you know, there are millions of people and many elected leaders who believe that gun ownership is more important than innocent lives. And that's just just to own it, because that's that's what that's the decision that you've made. And you keep keep standing behind that decision and refusing to limit gun ownership. So first off, just own it. Um, don't come to a situation like this and offer your grief and thoughts and prayers when you're refusing to enact gun control legislation. When you, what well, we know, when you look at the, um, uh, the Brady data about who's accepting NRA donations, that you're accepting at least a million dollars a year, if not more. Um, Mitt Romney um, talked about how terrible this grief was. And then it was pointed out that he has accepted over $13 million from the NRA. So um, 
you know, you can't separate that. Uh, if you're taking NRA money, which promotes the distribution and dissemination of guns, um, this is what's going to happen. And, uh, and you can't somehow come back and say, I'm, I'm very sorry, I feel out of grief. When you're, you're responsible for this, you have, you have to own it. And the, this hypocrisy and dishonesty about there's kind of no connection between the, the platform and policies that I'm, I'm, I'm supporting and what's happening in America is just, it's just dishonest. You know, we, we, we focus on what happened yesterday and what happened 10 days ago. But the truth of the matter is there isn't a more violent country in the world. I'm talking about Africa and, you know, places where they're revolutionaries and, you know, then, then the United States. I mean, CNN runs kind of a scoreboard every week of the number of people who were killed in gun violence just in a regular week. In Chicago, it's like six to 10 a night on the weekend. I mean, it's an unbelievable situation. So yeah, I mean, you know, something like yesterday happens and everybody is mourning for, you know, 48 hours. But the truth of the matter is there's something and gun rights legislation is just a part of it. There's just something systemically wrong with America. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, you know, not in Hawaii and, uh, you know, maybe not in, uh, uh, you know, other, a few other states, but when you have, you know, what's happening in our major cities and what's happening in places like Texas, which encourage gun ownership, um, it's sad. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to stop hunters in Montana, although I don't believe in it, but somehow they consider that sport that they go out and shoot something that has no way of defending themselves. That's sport, isn't it? Just go out and kill a deer or a, you know, a bear, uh, you know, because it makes you, gives you an adrenaline, adrenaline rush. But, you know, I guess the framers had in mind that everybody should have a gun so they could go out and kill their neighbor when they pass the Second Amendment, rather than defend themselves against an invasion from a foreign power. Yeah, well, you know, the, the problem is, is, is Jeff is saying is that it's just been normalized. Um, somehow we've gotten to the point where we think that this is, this is the ordinary way of life, that, that this is just as normal as going to the grocery store and getting groceries, that every day, and it happens in the Twin Cities too. Um, every day there's somebody shot and often somebody killed. And uh, and now it's just been been routinized. And we we've come to the come to believe that this is this is normal life. And I think as Jeff has pointed out, it, it is it isn't normal life and it isn't normal life around the world. And you can go into other countries where you do not have this happening, and there's there's really no reason to tolerate it here. Well, we know that countries with far more restrictive gun access and ownership laws have far, far lower rates of gun violence. The number of incidents this year was indicated to be 212. That's more than one a day so far. So are there only two choices, one being more restrictions on gun access and ownership and use, and the other being increasing policing and enforcement and restriction on access to facilities, schools, churches, concerts, public places. Well, you know, we're supposed to be in a free society. Uh, you know, some of us of our age remember when you could walk into a school without going through a metal detector, without having security guards on every floor. You could go to a concert without having to go through a medical detector or a ball game. The country is sick. I mean, let's just face it. And what kind of democracy is it? What kind of freedom of movement do we have? Look at the airports, what you have to do to get on a plane. Now, you know, I know that's allegedly because of foreign terrorism, but we know that it's more than that. It's someone's going to bring a gun on a plane. Um, you know, I remember 
and this is 20 years ago, I went back to my high school for the day. I went back to where I was born and raised. And I just wanted to go back to the high school. And I was shocked at the security. And this is in a middle class neighborhood in Long Island, New York. At the security, 20 years ago, I could not get into the high school without passing, with showing my identification, passing a security guard, and going through a medical detector. I'm not talking about some inner city school in Chicago. And that's 20 years ago. So, you know, David's right. <clears throat> We've come to accept this as the new normal. And it's, it's sad. So what are the answers? I'm certainly not smart enough to know what it is. But I think, you know, you got to somehow figure out how to limit the ability of 18-year-old distressed individuals to get a long rifle and ammunition. That seems to me not to be that hard to do if you have the will to do it without infringing on the neighbor who wants to keep a gun in their home under lock and key for security. I, I got it particularly in the environment we're in. Yeah, you know, on Colbert last evening, they had the prime minister of New Zealand and they, they had an incident there. And he, yeah, was asking her, he was asking her, what, what did you do? And she said, well, you know, we felt as elected leaders, we had to take action and we had to remove guns. And that's what we did. Um, we bought guns back, we destroyed guns. Um, uh, you know, we felt it was incumbent on us, us to do that. The idea that we can, we can control the situation by greater law enforcement and being more vigilant, that's hopeless. Um, there's, there's so much unpredictability in terms of who's going to commit the next offense and where they're going to get the gun. You're never going to be successful at that. So I think you have to go to the other extreme and say that um, it's not extreme. You go to the other solution and say that. Uh, we've got to start to remove the guns. There's just too many guns. They're too, they're too readily available. Uh, they're easy to acquire. Um, we, that's the choice we have to make. But you know, David, and you know, we do talk about the law a little bit on the show. Uh, and as I just said, just wait a couple of weeks till the Supreme Court comes out overturning the New York ban on uh, carrying concealed weapons, et cetera. You know, even if there were states or the federal government, which will never happen, that would try to pass some kind of a legis some kind of legislation, it'd be in the courts in a second. And with 400 Federalist Society federal judges, I, I don't give it much hope uh, as long as the Second Amendment is going to be interpreted in a way that I just don't understand, but I'm not a judge. So. That's another impediment, that even if there was the legislative will, which there isn't nationally, and there is in some states and some cities, um, I, I don't give it much hope. Uh, you know, that, that amendment is, um, it's been perversely interpreted, and it's about ready to be perversely interpreted once more. Well, you know, we've got we've got very active and determined activists in support of the Second Amendment. And I suppose the, the call now is to be even more determined and active in terms of opposing that 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 aggressive liberal interpretation of that amendment to to make people accountable, to call them out, to um, you know, to point out, I'm not sure everybody knows who's getting NRA dollars and how many dollars they're getting. And to, to you know, make that public, circulate that information. I, I agree with Jeff that that it is troubling to think about, boy, what can we do that's going to be effective? I don't want to default to doing nothing um, because I want to try to do something. So I think that, that, that kind of outing the people that are supporting this legislation, either actively or behind the legislative doors with their votes, I think is an important step, so people know who's uh, who's uh, who's permitting this kind of uh, distribution of arms. I think that's something we can do. 
But again, it goes back to voting for the people that are going to take action to try and prevent this happening. And we know who that is in each campaign. Well, now it's up to getting people out to vote and making sure that the people who will uh, protect our children and protect us get elected. So we know that community interests, so especially public health and safety, have taken major, major hits over the last few years. And there's, they have been politicized. Is there anything other than electing people who will make different laws and policies for more protection against gun violence that's going to change the direction here? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll let David go first. Yeah, that's such a hard question. You know, not, you know, Jeff, Jeff mentioned something in the beginning, you know, and a week later, you know, which is true, he says, and maybe it was before we started recording, he said, you know, this happened and a week later, we'll, we'll just go back to normal. And that kind of has been our pattern. Um, you know, there'll be an outpouring of grief and regret for a brief period of time, and then we kind of go back to, to what it was. Um, so, so one thing we I guess can try and do is is to fight that that tendency to to forget what just happened um, and go back to the way things were and thinking it's not going to happen again, knowing it's going to happen again, um, to try and keep this um, on the forefront and be a little more active about that instead of moving on and turning to the next story, to not let this go away. Uh, and that's you know that's different than than electing the people that will uh, pass legislation support gun control legislation for example but that's more something we can do individually and independently to not let this fall by the wayside and keep it a point of discussion and keep pushing it forward and we can do that individually you know in the last 10 days that we haven't discussed this but three minority groups were targeted blacks in buffalo asians in California and Hispanics now in the school. There's been very little discussion about that. That's even a more worrisome aspect to this whole worrisome thing. This is what America's turning into. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because most of the murders are race on race. The statistics will show you that much of it gang related but the last three incidents that's worrisome that's worrisome now you know you can walk into a supermarket that's not in an african-american neighborhood and we've seen that where you can shoot up a bunch of white kids in connecticut you know or a bunch of white kids in parkland florida but the last three clearly have a racial motive Two have been established, and I'm sure we'll find out tomorrow or the next day that this one was equally racially motivated. And, and that that point has to be highlighted, that that some of the violence that we're seeing um, can be traced back to this whole discussion, discussion, advocacy. Uh, about white supremacy, the idea that um, whites are losing control of the destiny of the United States, we've got to reclaim it. Um, this whole idea of replacement theory, uh, we've got to fight it. Um, you know, no holes barred. Uh, the end justifies the mean, uh, the means. Um, yeah, I, I think I think trying to deconstruct these things. This whole idea of Christian nationalism, this idea that um, we were created as a Christian nation and that's slipping away from us. And that is the most critical thing in our lives. And uh, it's more critical than democracy. And uh, if, if in an effort to preserve that Christian heritage, we have to overturn elections, that's okay, because uh, our our, our Christian heritage is more important than than anything, and democratic principles. Um, I think we've got to. I, I think we've got to hit the, these ideas head on 
discuss them, be transparent about them, and, and rebut them. Uh, and and that's on, I guess, all of us to 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 be active in making these points and distinctions and point out, as Jeffrey just did, about the what happened in Buffalo um, that clearly was racially motivated, and not pretend that there that it's a random act. Well, we've seen the election results in the last week, and although some people are encouraged that, you know, some of the really crazy people didn't win, I'm not all that encouraged because some of the crazy people, and I mean crazy, won. I mean, Marjorie Green, who's completely loony and dangerous, won. The Republican nominee for governor of Pennsylvania is, I don't even know what to say certifiably insane uh yeah you know uh cawthon lost in north carolina uh um which i guess is good and kemp won in georgia um which i guess is good uh you know these are people that say not that they're uh, they don't believe the election was stolen but they're moving on from it i guess that's a good thing that that, that that's a good thing um you know, the results are mixed um, in these primaries on the Republican side, but, you know, there were a tremendous number of Republicans who voted in the Pennsylvania primary. I heard the other day, it was like a couple of hundred thousand more than have ever voted. And look who they nominated. I mean, look who they nominated for senator in Georgia, Herschel Walker. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's beyond me. Did anybody look into his background other than he was a football star in college? Uh, no. um, you know, and so what it says, David and Chuck, and we've talked about this since I've been doing this show, and this is the scariest thing to me, if you want to talk about scary, 40% of the country is crazy. I mean, I'm sorry, just crazy. And, you know, it's 40. It, it, that's, it, it's, it's not that far away from 50. And I think we're going to find on November 2nd, bad things. If we think things are bad now, wait till the Republicans maybe take both houses of Congress and more state legislatures. It's a, you know, yeah, we have inflation. Look, you could criticize the president and the Democrats in all kinds of ways. And one of our esteemed colleagues who's not on with us would be right out there saying a pox on everybody. But. The point is there's some, you know, some opportunity to stop these crazies from taking over, but they're getting close. Yeah, I'm, 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 I, I, I can only hope, and I, I do believe, particularly about in Pennsylvania, given the extreme positions that Mastriano is taking, um, and, and he's saying things like, you know, I have no hesitation in overturning an election. I, I believe that. Odin, you know, he says, I'm going, to re I'm going to repeal all voter registrations. We're going to start over. Everybody's going to have to re-register. Re You're going to have to be a white Christian to be eligible. Yeah, ba to vote. Basically, <laughs> you know, that, that's the hope. And, uh, and I'm going to appoint a secretary of state um, who believes just like I do, that, that you know, that, that the goal is to return to a Christian nation and, um, and uh, we won't hesitate. To, to intervene in elections if we don't feel it's going that way. So I, you know, my hope is that, yeah, I don't want to be so pessimistic and cynical that, that most people won't see that and think that this is dangerous and bad, and that when it comes to the actual election, they won't vote for this person. Um, that's, 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 you know, in the short term, that's, that's my hope. If that, if that isn't true, yeah, then then this nation's in serious trouble because it means we've we've abandoned democracy, and that that you know elections aren't going to matter anymore. Um, you know we're not going to be able to believe uh, that people were able to articulate their voice. Uh, we've become another kind of a country. And you're right on the mark. And. So what we're seeing is the normalization of violence, the normalization of racism and white supremacy, the normalization of literally unrestricted gun access on a practical level. 
And the combination of those things, plus the vocal politicization of and support for them, all combining to encourage, you don't need that many. Jeff is exactly right. You don't need that many of the 40% to engage in this kind of dangerous, destructive, lethal conduct and to get away with it. Yeah, and you know, the danger is that 40% is energized. So, you know, if 80% if, if of the 40% come out and vote and only 60% of the 60% come out and vote, um, you know, that, that former group's gonna be successful. And, uh, you know, so one way or another, we have to make sure that, that people are energized to come out and vote in spite of it being a little more difficult than it's been in the past. You know, there's no question that state legislators are trying to suppress the vote. They're making it harder to do the hours of voting, the availability of voting locations, um, all of that is getting harder. Uh, and we, you, you kind of can't, can't succumb to that. And you have to understand what the cost will be if you do. You know, and I don't have an answer, but I don't need to look to New Zealand, which obviously is a country that many people would like to live in. Just cross the border from where you are, David, Compare Canada and the United States as it relates to gun violence, gun ownership. Just, just look at Canada. I mean, you know, you don't have to go to a different culture, a different continent. You just have to go over the bridge in Windsor or whatever, uh, you know, and, and uh, or whatever the bridge is from Minnesota. And uh, why? What is it? No, Canada is not perfect. I mean, there's a lot coming about the way they treated the Aboriginal people, and et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just looking at gun violence. Have they had, you know, a couple of incidents? Sure. But why? What's the difference? I don't have an answer. Just a question. Yeah, well, you know, gun, guns have been glorified in our country. Um, you know, the whole history of the, the Wild West and gunslingers and I mean it, you know it's part of our mythology and uh you know that's that's true now that doesn't mean that that has to be sustained and reinforced but but I do think our, our culture has embraced that kind of independent um assertion of rights and uh almost glorified it uh, we've done it in cinema we've done it you know, in our in our storytelling. So yeah, it's deeply embedded in our culture in ways I'm not sure it is in, in Canada, for instance. But, but my guess is that lots of people in Calgary have guns. That, my guess is that almost everybody in Calgary has guns. I just, that's my guess from having been there. But I don't remember the last time somebody shot up a school in Calgary. I mean, there, there's a systemic problem that is not understood, addressed, I, I don't know the answer. It's just scary. And we're out of time for today. Thank you both so much. <laughs> on that note, on that optimistic note. <laughs> but we need to think about and commit to a different model for all of us. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming to Think Tech Hawaii. Come back, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take good care, be well, be safe, and be thoughtful. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.